Welcome to Fireside Chats, Forest, Fire, and Climate Science with the John Muir Project of Earth Island Institute. My name is Alice Goldberg, and I'm an organizer with the project. And today we're joined by our director, Chad Hansen, who received his PhD in forest and fire ecology from UC Davis and has been a forest ecologist in the field for the past 14 years. Today we're delving into the question, does logging reduce forest fires? And Chad, I was wondering if you could open us up with the answer to that simple question. Does logging help reduce or curb forest fires? No, actually, most of the time it has exactly the opposite effect. Uh, you know, people have this assumption that, that sort of makes intuitive sense to them that trees are fuel in the forest. And if you remove more trees, you're removing fuel and that should somehow make fires burn less intensely or just stop them. And, and that assumption has been around for a long time, um, but no one really tested it at a large spatial scale. So my colleagues and I got together and decided we would do just that and, and really dig into this question. So we published actually the very largest scientific analysis ever conducted on this question. Um, that was four years ago. It was called Bradley et al. 2016. And we published that in the journal Ecosphere. And we looked at three decades of data across the entire Western United States, 1,500 fires and uh, over 23 million acres. And what we found is two key things. First of all, the thing that is most important and influential in terms of determining how fires spread and burn, the variables that are most important are related to climate and weather. Not, not about how dense the forest is or anything like that. It's mostly about weather conditions, you know, whether it's hot, dry, windy conditions, you know, that's conducive to fires. But those weren't the only things that mattered. We also looked at the levels of protection that the forests have from logging. And what we found is that the forests with the very fewest environmental protections and the most logging, those forests actually burn the most intensely. So, you know, completely contrary to what, uh, what we're being told by a lot of politicians and, uh, and land management agencies. Those findings, at first glance seem a bit counterintuitive. I was wondering if you explained in your research why it is that you found pretty much the opposite of what a lot of people have been assuming. Yeah, yeah, we, we talked about it and there's actually a fair amount of research out there that helps to explain it. For most people, again, it seems intuitive. You remove trees and you're removing fuel, uh, but it actually doesn't work that way. So there's two key things that are happening. Number one, when forest fires burn, only a very, very small percentage of the tree biomass is actually consumed, even in a very intense fire. Really just the smallest uh, seedlings and saplings, some twigs, some pine needles, and the very, very outer layer of the bark. Uh, that's about it. It's only like two or 3% of the biomass of the trees. But when these logging projects under the guise of thinning occur, about 97% of what they're removing from the forest is basically medium and large tree trunks, which are literally non-combustible in a wildland fire. Even though it's being conducted under the guise of fuel reduction, these thinning projects, in reality, very, very, very little of what's being removed is actually fuel. So that's the first problem. The second one is that when these logging projects occur, like thinning projects, what they fundamentally do is remove a lot of trees and reduce the forest canopy cover. Because in a mature forest, you've got a lot of trees and you have a lot of cooling shade from that forest canopy. But what thinning does is it removes a lot of that. So now you've got hotter and drier conditions on the forest floor. And because you don't have as many trees, you don't have as much of a windbreak or wind buffer effect when the fires sweep through and when those winds are driving the fires. All that means is that the logging, like thinning, it changes the microclimate so that it's hotter, drier, and windier when a fire occurs. And that oftentimes makes fires burn more intensely. Okay. You can't be the only person who's studying this, so I'm wondering if you can let us know about one or two other studies that are out there on this subject and maybe one that includes um, information about thinning and looking at thinning specifically. Yeah, there have been a bunch of them that have been done and have found similar things, but I'll just mention two key ones. So one was done two years, uh, published two years after our study. It was called Zaldin Dunn, uh, 2018, uh, published two years after Bradley et al. They looked at a lot of the same things, but they, they did like a really deep dive on a specific large fire. 
And they found, number one, that the most important variables had to do with climate and weather. Uh, that's first, so similar to us. Number two, they found the most intensely logged areas in the forest burned the most intensely when fires occurred. And that's similar to our findings as well. And they also looked at the density of the forest. They found that the forests that were the densest when the fire occurred, they burned at similar or lower intensities in most cases. And so that's a really important finding as well. And that's similar to other research out there too. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying before, denser forests, more canopy cover, more cooling shade, more of a wind buffer. A lot of these things uh, operate in sort of counterintuitive ways. There was one more study called Cruz et al. 2014. These two studies are a combination of university researchers, forest service scientists, and others, a uh, mix of researchers. Cruz et al. found that thinning basically made the winds sweep faster through the forest when fires occur, and that makes the fires move quicker and burn more intensely. And so in most cases, the thinned areas burned more intensely. Can you share with us any examples of areas that were thinned and then experienced fire from an aerial perspective? There's a lot of examples of these. Unfortunately, logging operations conducted under the guise of thinning are very common across the country, especially in the Western US on public and private lands. I'll just mention a couple of examples. So you know, this one here is from uh, an area in the central Sierra Nevada. The first image is from 2005. This is satellite imagery. And uh, it shows a dense forest with high canopy cover, mature forest. And you can see that there's really high tree cover there. But that middle image is after thinning. And you can tell the difference because you can see a lot of bare ground, those light areas. That's basically where a bunch of trees have been removed. And then the last image, that was taken in 2014, one year after the rim fire occurred. And what you see there is most or, or of the trees, and in some areas, all of the trees were killed by the fire. It burned very intensely. And you can see the shadows of those fire killed trees and the areas where it's orange and brown um, instead of green because the needles on the trees were killed by the fire. And so this is just an example of, of how it actually operates. Instead of the less dense forest after thinning, burning at lower intensity, it actually burned more intensely. This is from the Eastern Oregon Cascades, west of Sisters, Oregon. And you can see in the middle there, just a very large thinning unit. You can see all that you know, bare ground, those light areas in between the trees. And then you can see unthinned areas, or um, in some cases, more lightly thinned areas surrounding it, those denser areas where you don't really see those patches of bare ground. And then the next image is after a fire occurred and after post-fire logging had occurred following that fire. And so it's actually really common on both public lands and private lands for post-fire clear cutting to occur after fires in areas where the fire burned very intensely, where it killed most or all the trees. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing the thinned area burned exclusively at high intensity, and that was all clear cut. Just a couple of trees were left standing there that survived the fire and weren't cut down. Whereas the unthinned areas, it was a real mix. Some of those burned at high intensity, some burned at low, and some burned at moderate. And you see like that lower edge there, that's mostly live trees in those unthinned areas. Those mixed intensity effects are natural in fires, but when thinning occurs, oftentimes it burns at the higher end of the spectrum. And you actually get more intense effects in places where they did the thinning ostensibly to reduce fire intensity. So it's really not having that effect. What about scientists who are backing up the narrative that logging forests reduces wildfire? Do those studies exist? And can you tell us a bit about them? That's an important question. And, and there definitely are. There's a whole series of studies, in fact, that have been published over the last 20 or more years by scientists who are affiliated with uh, logging interests. And, you know, they publish studies too, um, just like there are scientists who work for ExxonMobil who publish studies on climate change. We've looked really carefully at these studies. And, and of course, you know, logging interests want to promote thinning because it's a type of commercial logging and they make a lot of money doing it. But we found that there are several serious sources of bias in these thinning studies that, that are authored by people affiliated with logging interests. One of them, for example, is that they don't take into account how many trees are killed by thinning itself, which is a major problem. I mean, their basic narrative is, yes, we're going to kill and remove some trees with thinning in order to save a lot more trees. I mean, that's what the public is being told. 
But what we find when we look at these studies is that they don't report the overall cumulative tree mortality from thinning itself. And that's a major problem because it turns out that contrary to what people think when they hear the term thinning, it doesn't sound like it's that intensive to a lot of people. But in reality, uh, these thinning operations are killing and removing large percentages of the trees in the forest. And so you see here, this is a graph that, that I put together that is using data from a study called Stevens et al. 2009. They actually reported the number of trees killed by thinning, but they didn't include that in their overall final results when they reported on how wildland fire behaved. And so what they reported was that the thinned areas burned at slightly lower fire intensity, but they didn't tell their readers that if you actually included the number of trees killed by thinning, the overall mortality in the thinned areas was far higher than in just the, the no thinning areas that just burned in wildland fire without any thinning, which that's the, the bar uh, at the left there is no thinning, that's just wildland fire. And the next one over is thinning only, that's the trees were killed by thinning, there's, there's the orange there. And then the trees killed by wildland fire is the blue. And so obviously if you combine them, you get much, much higher levels of tree mortality. Um, and so what we're finding here is that these thinning operations are actually killing a lot more trees then they're preventing from being killed. But the public isn't being told that candidly by the authors of uh, some of these studies. Are there any photos that we have on the ground of what these thinning projects end up looking like? Yeah, you know, so um, this is really important. Jim, I'll just, there's lots of examples of this. I'm just gonna give one example here of a fairly typical, uh, what they call mechanical or commercial thinning project. Uh, on a national forest in the Sierra Nevada. This is the Dinky Thinning Project on public lands. And this is all funded with taxpayer money. And what you can see here is that it's pretty intensive. These are industrial logging operations, these thinning projects. In some areas, they kill and remove every single tree, including mature and old growth trees. And you can see that in the foreground. In other areas, they kill and remove half or so of the trees or more. And you can see that in the background there where some trees are, were, were left standing. But the overall effect is, you know, most of the trees in the forest are being killed and removed by thinning in many cases before the fire even occurs. So here's another example here, another photo, same thinning project, but a different area. And you can see the same thing in some areas like the foreground there, all trees killed and removed in other areas like the background on the left, some trees removed, others remain. But again, the overall effect across the landscape is that the majority of the trees are being removed in many cases, and uh, that includes mature and even old growth trees in these thinning projects. So, I mean, people hear thinning, they think uh, people out there with pruning shears, but, you know, that's not what's going on out there. There's an impact to have a, a large pile of debris left over, and, and there must also be some impact of the logging equipment on, on the ground and on on all of the systems in the forest itself. There are, yeah. In fact, we talked about changes to the microclimate that logging causes, creating hotter and drier and windier conditions. There are other reasons why logging, including thinning, increases fire intensity in most cases. One of them is what you just mentioned. You see in this image here, that big pile of branches and treetops and twigs, that's called slash debris. Uh, it's a, a logging term. And, and those things sit there oftentimes for many years after the thinning, because, you know, once they get the logs to the mill, they're not financially incentivized to come back and do anything about that slash debris. It'll sit there for a long time. And those are like giant bonfires waiting to happen in the forest. They will frequently increase fire intensity. But, you know, the other thing that happens is the logging equipment itself, these big heavy machines they use to log these forests, mm -hmm. that equipment spreads invasive, non-native combustible grasses like cheatgrass. And oftentimes these invasive grasses that are spread by logging will form very thick mats in logged areas and spreads flames uh, pretty quickly. And are there any other sources of bias in the data for some of these studies that are supporting this claim that logging helps reduce wildfires? There are several, but I'll, I'll give you one more that's significant, probably the second biggest one. These studies that are you know, conducted by scientists who are affiliated with logging interests, it's very, very common in these studies for them to, in scientific terms, we call it opportunistic uh, selection of data. And that's just a fancy way of saying they cherry pick their sites. 
And so really what this means on the ground in practical effect is that if you look carefully enough, you can always find some thinning units that burned at low intensity because fires are always variable. They burn at low, moderate, and high, a mix, depending on mostly what the weather is doing. But if you find three or four thinned units that happen to burn at lower intensity where not very many trees were killed, and you ignore the half dozen thinning units over the ridge that burned at high intensity, where most of the trees were killed by the fire, then you're going to present a very misleading and skewed picture of the effect of thinning on that fire. And we see that very, very commonly in these studies. We see sites that are focused on for the study are the ones that happen to burn at low intensity and the ones that burned at much higher intensities are ignored or excluded from the data. What I would say probably the third biggest source of bias in these studies, it's not in every one, but it's in quite a few of them. You'll see the abstract, which is, you know, the kind of the paragraph at the top of the study that the public reads or, you know, reporters or environmental activists, you know, people who are trying to understand the science. It's kind of broken down in, in kind of layperson terms. And the abstracts of these studies, the summaries will say, well, thinning was effective in reducing fire intensity. And if you look at the actual results of the study, what you find is that that's actually not true at all. And so, so here's an example. There's a study that just came out called Pritchard et al. 2020. Pritchard et al. claimed that, that thinning was effective at reducing fire intensity. But uh, when I looked at their actual results, just like some other studies like this, I found that most of the thinned areas burned at similar or higher intensities when the fire occurred. And so uh, it was definitely not the case that thinning was effective at reducing fire intensity. And it was a little misleading to say that because that only applied to a pretty small percentage of the areas that were thinned. Thank you, Chad. So the main takeaway from all of this is that the main factor that ends up driving forest fires is climate. And that can be the climate overall of, of a larger area, or it can mean the microclimate. And frequently, the logging activities that we see on our lands actually ends up impacting the microclimate such that it increases the likelihood for that forest to burn at a higher severity. Is that all right? That's right. Yeah. Basically, the more logging that occurs and the more intensive the logging is, typically it means fires will spread faster and burn hotter. And so it's accomplishing exactly the opposite of what the proponents of thinning claim they're going to accomplish in most cases. Okay. Well, thank you, Chad, for sharing your knowledge on this subject matter. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining and learning with us about forests, fire, and climate science. If you're watching this in Demio, you can find a reference list and the copy of Bradley et al. in your handouts. And please fill out the poll to let us know how you found out about this video. Learn more by visiting our website and follow us on social media for more information and action updates. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss out on our next fireside chat. Do wildfires destroy forests? So thank you very much. Thank you.